Hi everyone, this is Elias Martin of CollectingJapanesePrints.com. Welcome to my first seminar on Facebook Live, uh, Linked Verse, Koshiro Onchi and his circle of print artists. Uh, today we have quite an ensemble of um, very rare and important 20th century um, Japanese prints. And um, I, I want to talk a little bit about what we'll be looking at um, and sort of put everything in context. And then we could get into looking at the prints themselves and we could uh, have a conversation about the, the process, the, the way the artists achieve the effects, um, and of course admire the artwork. Uh, but before we get there, um, the, the title of this uh, talk or the seminar, Linked Verse, um, I chose it because it, it, it's, a, it's a good metaphor for what was happening during post-war uh, Japan in, um, in Onchi's circle. Um, and, and so uh, for those of you who are not familiar, in Japanese poetry, a linked verse is when um, one poet starts the poem and another poet continues uh, the poem with either a similar theme or there's, there's sort of an influence and a continuation and a development of the poetic um, main thoughts or, you know, th there, are, there are some thread that goes through the poem that sort of creates a whole. And, um, and I think this is a good analogy for uh, the prints of this period. Uh, it, Onchi was certainly the the leader of the group in many ways. He was sort of the, like people like to say he was the spiritual leader. He was he was the creative sort of inspirational figure in the group. He also um, helped a lot of the artists financially with food. And so, I mean, he was very much the leader of the Sosaku Hanga movement right after the war. Um, and so, maybe I should step back a little bit. And uh, I'm assuming uh, that all of you are familiar with Onchi. And if you're a fan of my uh, Woodblock Wednesday videos, I'm sure that you've seen some Onchi prints. Um, and if, if you're new, welcome. And I encourage you to have a look at my Woodblock Wednesday videos and join us every Wednesday. Um, but uh, for those of you who are not familiar, Koshiro Onchi was, an, uh, was a probably, I would argue, the most important 20th century printmaker um, in Japan. He started his work um, of printmaking in college um, when he produced the first work of abstraction in printed form in 1915. So he was a, a visionary and he was very much ahead of his time. Abstraction was not understood in Japan at that time and so in order to promote self-directed self -directed printmaking, he started working in representational formats. Um, and so for all, also for all those of you who don't know, Sosaku Hanga are prints that are produced entirely by the artist. Um, so the artist conceives of the design, carves the blocks and prints the prints. And this stands in stark contrast to other movements, um, other print movements in Japan. For example, the older ukiyo-e style of printmaking was a collaborative process when there was a publisher who hired the artist to make the design. And of course, the artist sketched out uh, the design or created a watercolor or a painting of it. And then the publisher looked at the, uh, the design, approved it or recommended um, edits, modifications to the design, and then they went ahead and the publisher had his staff of artisans, woodblock carvers, and printers to actually produce the print. Um, the Shinhanga movement of the early 20th century continued that um, mode of printmaking. And so Sosaku Hanga artists did not see themselves as just Hanga artists, but they saw themselves as just artists and they were influenced um, as much by the Europeans who were making prints um, and paintings in a very free self-directed style uh, and so so they did prints in that manner um, just because they're woodblock prints doesn't necessarily mean that the, the artists were approaching the artwork from the same place they were very 
different approaches. So, uh, you know, that, that's actually kind of interesting and also very important to understand uh, before we really get into these prints. And so Onchi was one of those artists that was very creative, very forward thinking, innovative, and also he was financially um, set. His family had money and he was a really successful wood, um, well, he was a successful, successful um, at creating uh, book covers and, uh, and covers for musical scores and, and a lot of other graphic design, what we would call graphic design work now. And, and so what, what's interesting is he had a, a very successful career. It was artistic, but it was more commercial. Um, and he had a cash flow coming in through all of those projects. And he looked at his woodblock prints as his sort of an artistic, solely artistic um, mode of expression. It was not a commercial driven enterprise. For him, he wanted to promote the, the, the genre of Sosaku Hanga. So certainly he was creating work that could get uh, the attention of you know, connoisseurs, critics, the government. In fact, for a long time, prints were relegated as a lower class of art form, not as, as high as painting. And it was Onchi that actually got Sosaku Hanga artists in certain exhibitions which was uh, quite an achievement. Um, and so for him, printmaking was completely artistic and, and individual, and um, it was a mode for him to express himself, his feelings, his way of, of thinking. It, it was not, um, again, it was not commercial. He, he did not in any way think about what can I produce in order to sell these prints, because honestly, he didn't need the sales. And he approached printmaking pretty much that way his entire life. And when the, of course, I should point out that most of his life, uh, Sosaku Hanga prints were not um, commercially viable. So most Sosaku Hanga artists who were artists, um, who we could talk about, they had side jobs for the longest time. So in the 30s, um, in the 20s, in the 40s, they were doing other things. And it wasn't until after the war when the Western occupying forces arrived in Japan, which brought them, you know, people interested in art, that uh, they were very interested in Japanese prints, particularly the Sosaku Hanga style of printmaking. And so it was, so in our conversation today, I want us to basically uh, focus on the, the sort of the war years and then what happened immediately after the war years and, and what, uh, what was the sort of conversation, the artistic conversation happening um, with Onchi and around him with his circle of artists. And, um, and so that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, and, and so we'll start actually with a print that is um, a pre-war design. And I talked about this print in my in my Woodblock Wednesday from, from earlier this week. So if you want some more information on this print, um, I encourage you to look at my Woodblock Wednesday, just the, the one that just occurred. I have that um, on my website. All of my Woodblock Wednesdays are archived on my website, collectingjapaneseprints.com. And um, of course, you know, you could, if you're my uh, Facebook friend, you could just scroll down and, and find the video. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, have a look. So what, what we could discuss is here, I'm going to reposition myself to, to take a better advantage of the light. The light is uh, much better coming in from the other side. And um, so we will do it that way. So this print is one of the most 
famous 20th century designs um, produced by any artist. Um, it is a work by Onchi, and it was produced in 1943. So technically, it, it's, it's pre uh, the occupation. And so it is a design that showcases his friend, um, the poet Hagiwara, who actually had passed away in 1942. So the design is a posthumous um, design, it's a posthumous portrait of his friend. And Hagiwara was a surrealist that uh, started his work at the turn of the century. He and Onchi became friends when Onchi was actually in um, in college. And Onchi, Tanaka, and Fujimori, uh, two other artists that were working with Onchi at the time, all contributed designs to his poetry books. Particularly um, noteworthy is his book, Howling at the Moon. Um, those poems are quite compelling, and there's really wonderful... Um, designs by the three artists throughout the, the book. And so Hagiwara, it, it's been uh, recounted that Hagiwara was quite depressed by what by the, the years leading up to the war. It was a quite a dark time for artists in Japan. And, and so he, he basically drank himself to death. And Onchi was really affected by his death and decided to make a memorial portrait of him. And um, I won't go into the other impressions that were made by other artists, and partly because I just made that video. But also, I should just point out that this is a very rare early self-printed uh, copy by Onchi. And, you know, I'm going to zoom in, you can see... This impression is quite different from any other, partly because of the way that it's printed. It's very loose. The, the pigments rest right on the surface of the paper and, 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 and is very expressive. Uh, the, the work has a, has a strong presence. It, ha it carries sort of the, the feeling that one would see or, and feel um, looking at a Rembrandt painting, it, 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 it does more than just show an image. It almost gives an essence of the person. And the, this, this portrait is deeply psychological. It's wrought with emotion and, and dread and sadness and maybe a mix of hope. Um, but the, the unfortunate part is that he did die. And, and Onchi was really trying to capture his friend and the demons he was battling um, within. And so, you know, I'm going to zoom in and I want to just show the wonderful printing effects on this print. It has kind of a loose, wet printing style. And Onchi basically... I don't know if he invented it, but he definitely exploited it and made it popular. And in in and we will see in some of the prints that 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 there is a kind of a looseness of the pigment on the surface. And so this design from 1943 was so popular after the war that his assistant and and close friend Sakino. Um, I would. I wouldn't really call him a close friend. I would call him more of a a follower and a uh, and 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 an admirer and maybe disciple. Uh, partly because they were. Um, I think Onchi was at least ten years older, and they had more of a teacher student relationship. But he gave Sakino the blocks to reproduce this um, design in fifty impressions, and after Onchi's death. Uh, Harai printed another 50 as a memorial tribute, and then the Onchi family issued another 10 in the 1980s. And, you know, based on those impressions, you could, you could take from that is that this design was highly popular. And it's, it's basically an icon of the Sosakuhanga movement. So I'm going to attempt to show you other works now that I think were greatly influenced um, by, by um, Onchi's uh, portrait of Hagiwara. This work is by the artist Takumi Shinagawa. And Shinagawa was one of the artists that was working in Onchi's circle. 
He um, knew all of the artists that Onshu was working with, and he was influenced by Onshu, but he was also influenced by Picasso. And um, Onshu was a great teacher for Shinagawa because Onshu was very, he was versatile. He was able to create prints that were representational and had a strong emotional component, but he was also able to create abstraction. And Shinagawa was one of those artists that worked in both, um, much like Onchi. And so this early work is a, a print design based on a Picasso painting. Um, the painting is much larger. And you know, if we zoom back a little bit, I could point out that in the painting, there, were, there was another figure here and a lot of other activity above and below. But, you know, coming back into the image, you could see that Shinagawa wanted to primarily focus on the harlequin. This boy that's looking out to the right, much like the Hagiwara portrait here, you could see that the, the, the composition is very similar in the sense that it's a three quarters length portrait and they're both looking to the, to, to the left. Let's see if we could um, sort of pan out and you could see both of them. But, and they're roughly the same size too. I should point that out as well. They're roughly the same size. And, and, and so the, the, the interesting thing is the palette is similar. It's subdued. Um, Shinagawa uses more uh, kind, of, kind of blues and grays, but the way that the light filters in on the face, it's very expressive. And it's very similar to the Hagiwara where the light is coming in from the same direction. And we get a same um, effect in the sense that the both, both portraits are, are, are of, of people that are lost in thought. They're, they're contemplative. And, and we could see that in both of them. And the, the other work I want to point out, oh, I should say this Shinagawa, if I didn't mention this um, earlier, it is a post-war design. So this is circa 1948. It's not dated. And, and so I'm not certain when it was uh, truly executed, but this print um, belonged to the uh, belonged to Oliver Statler and, and it was in the Statler collection for quite a while. And I believe in, in his notebook, in his log, he indicated that this was done in 1948. So um, that, that's, that's where um, I get the attribution to that. Now, I want to point out another portrait by Shinagawa that is quite famous. It is his Kabuki actor portrait. This was done in 1953, uh, much later. And this is when Shinagawa really found his voice as an artist and started produ producing experimental woodblock prints of, of abstract designs. He used paper blocks, much like Onchi. Onchi actually started that technique. And also Shinagawa was a sculptor. Uh, and, and, and so he was influenced by his own sculptures. And in this design, we see here up the profile of the, the face of the Kabuki actor, but if we zoom out a little bit, you th this area here kind of sticks out and it creates sort of, it, 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 it makes the eye believe that the, the profile sort of disappears and, and, and returns. It, it's a really interesting sort of work. It's dramatic. It's certainly um, worthy of being called a kabuki actor because of the connection to the drama of kabuki. The, this design is very dramatic. And, 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 and it's very powerful and it's considered Shinagawa's masterpiece. Now the, the portrait is facing me in the other direction. But I just wanted to show this one because the, the artists continued the conversation and they furthered it. And so in this tradition, in the Sosaku Hanga school of the artists working around Ochi, they didn't replicate Onchi works. They, they moved on and, and did things that, that, were, that was satisfying to them. And you, you, in other arenas of art, um, I won't go into specifics, but you, you see the master do something and, and it's quite successful. And then the, the students just copy it and then and continue the, the tradition. The, the, the circle of artists around Onchi did not do that. 
they, they were certainly influenced by Onchi, but they moved on and did things on their own, in their own way, to say the things they wanted to say. So, you know, I just wanted to point that out. The next portrait that I want to show is a work by Sakino. And this work is probably one of Sakino's most well-known um, portrait designs. It, it illustrates, this is a, a kabuki actor and uh, without the makeup, of course. And, and Sakino shows him sort of lost in thoughts, but he adds a, a, a design by Sharaku um, in the background with another figure from uh, Kuniyoshi. And, and, and so in this portrait, um, much like the, the Hagiwara portrait, Sakino does a really great job of not just replicating an image that he painted. And it's a really good likeness of the artist, I mean, of the, um, of the Kabuki actor, but it's also very expressive. And, and we could see a very similar palette to his, uh, to his teacher's uh, portrait of, of Hagiwara. Hagiwara. The, the, the format's very similar. The, the, the sheet size, I'll pan out a bit, is also, it's, it's almost the same. And so the format, the size, all of those things really connect this Sakino print to the Hagiwara. And, and in fact, um, Sakino produced this print in the late 40s. Here we have the date on here, 1948 in April. And this was done when Sakino was participating um, in the Ichimoku Kai meetings. And we'll get into Ichimoku Kai in a moment. But the, Sakino was actively working in and around of Onchi's uh, studio. And so certainly Sakino was aware of Hagiwara's uh, portrait. In fact, I believe, you know, I think it was 1948 when Onchi asked Sakino to continue the, the Hagiwara production. Onchi is, is credited to producing one, one single impression in 1943. And then after the war, he was urged by followers and fans of his work to produce more. And there's estimates of about maybe 12 um, that were done. And after the 12, he, he just stopped. And, you know, if you're fortunate enough to look at the Onchi self-printed works of Hagiwara and you're able to look at different impressions, you will notice that they're all very different. And that is an Onchi um, sort of technique. He, he basically makes mono prints. Every impression is different. And not just by minute details. I mean, like the overtly very different. One impression can give you a, a very different feel from another. And Sakino uh, was a very capable print artist, and I'm sure he imp impressed Onchi with this portrait, and I could see why Onchi gave him the, the, the chance to produce the 50 uh, designs, or the 50 impressions of, of uh, Hagiwara. So I want to point out how well printed this design. It almost has a three-dimensional effect. The image sort of moves forward. The head of this of the the actor moves forward and the background is is a bit flat. And it's showing designs from Ukiyo-e that are flat. The this Shiraku design is a very flat uh, design. It's a beautiful print, if you've seen it in person, with the mica ground in the background, but it's flat. It's, it's ukiyo-e. And, and the kuniyoshi is a cartoon. And it's based on a larger uh, um, sort of design with other cartoons. And, and so they're meant to look flat and, and in, in the background. But this portrait is so well developed and articulated that it, it just moves forward. It, it's, it's actually quite amazing. And there are later impressions of this design done by Sakino's studio after he became quite successful. And this was in the late 50s, mid to late 50s. 
and they they don't have this three dimensional effect. The the hair here is particularly well done. It almost you get almost get the sense of light. And again, the light is coming in from the right side, much like the portrait um, uh, Hagiwara. And so you know, I just wanted to point out these portraits that that are connected. They're influenced by Onchi, Onchi's work, but they have their own way of expressing themselves as well. The designs are still different. The emotions um, that are conveyed are different. And where Onchi is emotional, Sakino is contemplative. Sakino is more, I, I read him more as intellectual. And whereas Onchi was first, I mean, his thought, his, his thoughts are certainly part of his artwork and he's innovative in a very thoughtful way. His abstract designs are, are thought provoking and very compelling, but his printing is, I, I think, paramount um, in, in how we look at Onchi prints. And that's what comes forward first. And for, for Sakino, I, the way I read his designs is the design comes through first. And then, of course, his ability to produce uh, this print in such a great way um, is there. But it's more design and thought forward, if I could put it in those terms. So, of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I, these are just my ideas. I, there's, of course, other people believe differently. But, um, but yeah, it's in my experience that's, that's how I've... Of seeing them. So now, now that we've seen some prints that are, that were done as portraits, I want to sort of talk about Onji's circle of artists during the war and right after the war. And um, during the war, even I think up to, right leading up to the war, and then certainly during the war and afterwards, there was an organization, a group, not really an organization, but a club that was organized by Sakino and Yamaguchi, Gen Yamaguchi, and the club was called Ichimoku Kai, and it, st it stood for um, when the, the members would meet. And so Ichimoku Kai means the first Thursday club. And so the, the, the organization or the club uh, started uh, partly because the artists wanted to um, get together, discuss printmaking, and also be around Onchi because he was such an inspirational figure to all of them. And so the meetings occurred in Onchi's home. And particularly during the war, Onchi was um, very generous and gave the artists paper, wood blocks, tools when they needed it, and most importantly, food. Um, after the war, there was a lot of food shortages and a lot of the artists were starving. In fact, one very significant um, Sosaku Hanga artist died of malnutrition. His name was Taninaka Yasunori. And he was around Onchi, but he didn't intend, uh, he did not attend these meetings and I almost wished he did because he would have, he would have lived. Tan Taninaka Yasunori was basically surviving off pumpkins in a little pumpkin patch he had in his uh, just outside his home that was bombed out. He was living, you know, in, in in a shelter that he put together from the scraps of his home, and and so he died, um, it, very tragically. He was such an important um, artist as well. And if if you're not familiar with him, I encourage you to look him up and look at his work. His name is Taninaka Yasunori, but for the artist that did. Um, attend these meetings, what they did was they created a yearly sort of book magazine style publication in the number of the attendees. So in 1948, I, I'd have to look this up, but I think there were like, you know, 20 some members, maybe, maybe more. And they, it was, it's kind of like interesting, right? It's almost like a yearbook. So this is the cover in for 1948 Kitaoka Fumio Kitaoka that's his signature created the cover of this issue and the the, the publication was Ichimoku Shu so the publication from the club that meets every every th the first Thursday of every month and so what you would have is 
I mean, I'm very fortunate to show you this. I have two complete sets. This is from 1948. And the, the print, in addition to the cover, we have a signature page. And these were the informal signatures of the artist that attended that day. And what, the, what happened was that the, the artist brought, you know, let's just say there were 29 members in this year. They would bring 29 prints. And so they would create these albums. These loose sheets of, uh, of, uh, of prints were put into sort of a, a bigger folder. I don't have the folder for this set, but for, I have the folder from 1946. And this was, um, this is calligraphy is actually done by Onchi himself. That's his, one of his many seals dated 1946. And this was the the original folder where all the prints were put into. Now, the folder for this set has not survived, but I have all of the, the, the prints and as well as the signature page, which is kind of cool. And, you know, you see all of the, the signatures to all of the artists that participated. Sometimes on these, in these sets, you, you don't see all of the signatures. I would imagine maybe sometimes in the hustle bustle of signing things and putting things together, they forgot to sign the, the sheet. Kind of like your yearbook. You know, there are some people that you're probably missing. Uh, same thing here. And, and I'll just point out for our conversation um, today, this is Onji's signature right here. So this, this set is really interesting. It, 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 it has quite a diverse selection of prints. They're all very, very different. And I just want to highlight a few designs. This particular work is, an, it's another work by Kitaoka. So for this particular issue, Kitaoka created the, the, the front page of the, or the frontispiece for this, this magazine. And he also contributed a design, a finished design. And this is a fantastic work. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't know who the portrait is. I'd have to look it up, but I think he's a novelist. And the, the point is, it's very, very similar to the Hagiwara portrait. It's similar, but it's also different. The color is subdued. Kitaoka uses a stronger uh, sense of light. The, most of the print is very, very dark, and there's just some light trailing in. Whereas Onji's Hagiwara, there's a lot more light involved, though certainly there's areas where the light is much more pronounced on the face. Uh, but I, in this portrait by Kitaoka, you could see also the technique of, of how he printed. It's very wet. It, 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 I mean, it, it has that effect of, 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 that Onchi achieved on his prints. And so it, it almost reads like a watercolor. And on Unchi prints, they read like paintings because the pigment rests right on top of the, 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 the paper of the print. Here, the paper is a little bit more absorbent. See, I'll flip it over so you could see how saturated the, the back is. But nonetheless, the portrait still displays those unchi esque qualities. And so this is yet another example where the artists are influenced by Onchi's technique and even his mode of expression, but yet they, they're reworking it uh, to achieve their own aims. So um, what I'll do is I'll show some other things. This might be, might be getting a little bit ahead of the conversation, but this happens to be the next print in, the, in, the, uh, in order of this set. This, this print is by Gen Yamaguchi. And Yamaguchi was a disciple of Onchi. And he's a kind of interest, interesting fellow. He, he met Onchi. He's always known about Onchi. Onchi was like this figure everyone wanted to meet. And he, he was part of a, I might even call it a religious cult. And he, he sort of went around the, the country just doing good deeds in some ways and, and just, just doing stuff for, for people. 
And, and he showed up at Onchi's house um, and he asked him if he needed any help with anything. And, and, and so I don't know if Onchi put him to work, but they started talking. And Genya Maguchi was, was a print artist before meeting Onchi. There's many designs that, um, that you can look up and see. And they, have, they had a similar aesthetic Maybe Unchi was an influence to him earlier in his career. I think he was, and, and I can prove it, but that's another conversation. Uh, but in this case, this print um, illustrates uh, des a design that uh, Yamaguchi produced using found objects. The, 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 these forms are created with leaves, this one looks more like a leaf. This one um, looks more like a gourd, but it's been printed with a leaf. So he probably cut it out in this shape. And this looks like, I don't know, it's a natural form. It, it looks like a piece of a plant of some kind. And of course, these other forms are constructed by Genya Maguchi, probably cut them out, but they look like they're leaves. The su the surface reads um, as if they're their leaves, and both Onchi and Genya Makuchi they both have said this that they've arrived at this this technique at the same time through experimentation, and so in the in the mid forties both Onchi and, ya and Yamaguchi started printing with found objects, found like, so leaves and string and, and shoe, um, you know, shoe bottoms and other, other kind of things that are just kind of laying around. And so he, he really uh, picked this up. This sort of, this reminds me of almost like Picasso and Brock um, when they were both working together during their Cubist um, period. Um, it's kind of hard to say who, who did what when, because they were doing it at the same time, but they all, but at the, at the end of the day, Picasso took cubism in one direction and Brock's cubism went in another direction. And in fact, I think, I don't think Brock ever, you know, recovered. He was always doing something that was cubist. Um, and for Yamaguchi, I, I think that's a good analogy. He, he and Onchi sort of converged with this technique, but both artists went in different directions. And of course, Yamaguchi lived a much longer life and so produced a lot more work after this sort of period of, st or this style of printmaking. So I'm just going to flip through uh, this, this set of, and just show you just, just a few. Designs by these artists. You could see on this one, this artist is Ota. You could see the 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 printing style is very loose, very onchi esque. Though the subject, you know, it's just a floral. Nonetheless, the the printing technique uh, still connects to the master. Um, in this abstract work, it's I think it's a shell and some other objects, but it's also kind of abstracted. This is a, a mimeograph, and so not even a woodblock print. And this also kind of shows how inclusive the, the, these meetings were. There were artists that were etchers and painters, and they, they all made prints um, working around Onchi. This is an interesting design by Tomo Inagaki. He's most known for his cat designs, uh, but here um, it's a really interesting sort of almost cubist-like um, still life. And you could see here that the print is dated, uh, not dated, it's numbered 19 out of 22, which means there were 22 members of this um, of this Kai, of this, of this club, of this particular year. The, the membership fluctuated per year, so it wasn't always 22. I think it went up to even close to 30 in some years. But, you know, I just wanted to, just want to show how, how different these prints are. And yet, these are all works done in this group that was, um, you know, around Onchi. This is a Hatsuyama. He was a children's book illustrator, and you could, this wild and really fantastic design, 
I think these are mermaid type creatures. They're in or underwater and they're sort of kind of floating around doing their thing, but it, it's so beautiful um, how, how the, the print was made. Very expressive. So on this print, just which 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 is interesting. If I read that correctly, correctly, that looks like five out of thirty. And so in this case, Hatsuyama made more than he needed, which you know makes sense because he he I think went on to sell quite a few of these. Um, but you know that just gives you a sense of of some of some of these prints, what they looked like. Um, yeah. Let's see if there's another one. Uh, oh, you know what? There's one more portrait that I'll show. This is a, a really interesting portrait of a girl. And this reminds me of the Shinagawa print that we saw of the Harlequin earlier. It, it has that same sort of style of printmaking. But of course, this, this style is, um, if we're drawing the lineage, it goes back to Onchi. And it has that really expressive, soft printing effect. All right, I, I think we're good for this set. So well, I'll, what I'll do is I'll show portions of this set to give you a sense of a little bit more of this Ichimoku Kai. And um, at the end of our talk, I'll point out some reference books that might be helpful to all of you if you're interested in learning more about this period of Japanese printmaking. There's one particular uh, book uh, by Lawrence Smith uh, who, that, who really outlined this, this period of, of time. And he actually illustrated a lot of prints from this particular uh, year of the Ichimoku uh, Shu. So this is a work by Onchi. It's abstract work. It, there's this sort of halo-like egg shape with smaller ovals and, and, and fragments of, of body parts. Very Onchi-esque of what was he was doing at the time. Um, but it's interesting because that one kind of looks very quickly produced. And um, it's not, I don't think it's one of his best, I, quite frankly. And I should point out that most of the Onchi designs for these Ichimoku shoes aren't his best work. There's a couple that are stellar pieces, but most of them by, by and large are okay, which kind of speaks to something. It speaks to the fact that Onchi worked best in smaller editions. His, some of his best work is done in an edition of one, and they're mono prints. And so, you know, it's interesting to, to note that. Now, in this particular um, year, Sakino reworked a design. Sakino reworked a design um, that that belonged to another artist. And in fact, if I remember correctly, Onchi scolded Sakino for taking someone else's design and reworking it without um, his permission. And I think the artist's name is Ishii. And um, Ishii was not a member of this particular uh, year. I don't even think he participated in any of the Onchi-led um, um, grouping, group outings. But there was a little bit of controversy on this design. So I just thought I'd point that out since it was right there. Um, here is a Sakino work. It's one of the many impressions of, of, of this. There's a, a lot of different versions of this design, and, and, and he reworked it. Um, and it just shows us, um, his hometown. And it, I think there's like a, a, a spa right here that he'd like to uh, illustrate. Now, in this particular year, uh, it was a really interesting, very fruitful year because there was a lot of artists that participated. This is a really interesting work by Hide Kawanishi. Um, and Kawanishi was a woodblock print artist um, at this point for over 20 years. And he was, he was um, uh, when did he get his start? Yeah, he was doing work. His earliest prints are from 1920. And this is this this is in the forties, so he mid forties. So yeah, he's been working for over twenty years, and yet he 
he attended these meetings because he knew how important they were to to be around artists who were experimenting, who were interested in artistic trends from all over the world. And Kawanishi was very cosmopolitan. He 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 really looked out for for trends that were coming in from all over the world. And in this design, it's kind of an interesting, simple, elegant work of a it, it looks like pottery with like a piece of uh, um, textile uh, and he simply just sealed it there and it it has that kawanishi sort of ask that uh, quality where it's really kind of slightly busy and you know you 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 sort of kind of see the the patterns uh, that you're used to seeing for kawanishi prints so it's kind of neat that is in this uh, set Another work that I can show is by Azechi. The He worked with Onchi uh, before the war and certainly after the war. And what a lot of people don't know is some Onchi prints that were reworked um, were done by Azechi. Azechi, like Sakino, were sort of Onji's assistants, um, and there's several prints out there that were printed by Zechi that look very convincing um, to the to the sort of first glance, if not second or third by a novice. You really have to uh, sharpen your eye on what Onji printed works. Some seriously Jizuri's, uh, Jizuri in the sense that, I use that term because Onji used that term, self-printed work looks like self-printed work by Onchi. When you see it and you get used to it, you'll you'll be able to identify it rather quickly. But for for people who don't see Onchi's prints all that often, there's a lot of, of, of different impressions out there in the marketplace. And some of them aren't printed by him and they're printed by his assistants. So Zechi was one of them. Here's a really cool design by Saito. Uh, this year was one that hosted both Kawanishi and Saito, and it was the only year that had both of those artists um, together. So it's a really cool design of Ginza, uh, and it, it actually sort of speaks of better days ahead. You don't see the, the, the gloom of the, the war. Um, and, and, and so the other, the other thing about this design is that... Um, I mean, as I said, it's very sort of future oriented. It, it it reminds me a little bit of the Jetsons. It has kind of like a, a kind of a future uh, f future esque quality of what the people from the fifties thought the future would look like. Um, and so, but anyway, it's a really cool design. And I, and I, I'll 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 stop with this set on this very this last print and. Um, and this is an important print for, for our conversation. This print is produced by uh, Yamaguchi, Gen Yamaguchi. And um, he, he, we saw a work in the other set that was that abstract leaf print. Well, this one is a representational design, clearly. It shows a flower in a glass, and there's like a curtain that kind of echoes uh, a sense of, of light coming in. You could see the wet printing technique on the surface that is very Onchi-esque. I, mean, I just want you to look at that for a moment and see how, how thickly applied the pigment is and how it rests on the surface. I'm gonna quickly move to the Hagiwara. You could see same technique. That's kind of neat. It's, it's kind of neat to be able to show you something printed by someone else um, and connect the two instantaneously. So that's pretty cool. Um, and so in this design, some people have uh, um, sort of, I think Lawrence Smith mentions uh, this in one of his write-ups about this design, that the it's a commentary about the darker war or post-war years. You have the the bloom falling from the flower or the leaf from the flower, and it has kind of a Though the colors are bright, there's kind of almost like a somber quality to it, um, and maybe a commentary of of what, of how Yamaguchi was feeling at the time. Now, 
I want to make it clear, Japan, the Japanese culture is not one that encourages people to talk about how they feel about anything, really. It's, it's, a, it's a culture that actually encourages silence and contemplation and, and sort of just working things through inside in your mind. But it's not one that it's not. In fact, I think about this a lot. Uh, the American sort of style of saying what's on your mind is the antithesis, antithesis of the Japanese style of just kind of holding things in. And so in this print, it's subtle. It, it should be subtle. He's a Japanese artist. But the commentary of what was happening at the time is certainly still there. Why would an artist show a, a beautiful flower and yet part of the petal has starting, you know, has fallen? And the, the, the flower is now incomplete. Though I think the composition actually is kind of cool. You could kind of picture this, you know, the, the portion of the flower right here. And so, you know, that, that may be saying something. So, you know, I thought I'd point that out. So, okay, M moving on from the Ichimoku uh, Kai, which is a very, very important group. And I, I just wanted to spend some time on it because uh, the, the sets, these complete sets don't come up for sale all that often, if at all. And it's wonderful to be able to examine um, the 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 prints here with all of you in this context, because really that's, that's, that's what we're, we're, um, we're talking about right now. So I am, I would like to show you some, some prints by Onchi that are very important. And also a bit, were really influential to other print artists. And I'm going to see, let me see if I can put out a couple. Just gotta be very careful with these prints. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Um, we have a very important uh, trio of prints by Onchi that were done in 1954. Uh, they're, they were done right at the end of his life. And with Onchi, the, the tragedy of this is that he was producing his best work at the very end of his life. You know, it's that's something that is rarely said about artists. And for him... Since, since he passed away um, relatively young, uh, you know, you, you kind of wonder what would have been. Um, but in these th three prints, and I'll talk about each of them, and then we can look at some designs by other artists that were influenced by them. So this is a work that was produced with found objects. The background is done in wood blocks, different wood blocks that he sort of put together. And it, I think Oliver Statler in his book um, on the Sosakuhanga artist that he was uh, involved with, particularly Aonji, he mentioned that these blocks of wood came from his daughter's home when she renovated it. They were, they, she just you know, she was about to toss all these or they were out ready to be picked up. And Aonji removed some of the blocks from the, the garbage and took them home and he printed the background of this really striking um, design. And the red here is actually pieces of Japanese charcoal that was cut um, or broken off and, and he basically, basically inked it and then he added the, the ink to the, to the charcoal and stamped them across the, the plane of the blocks. And so for Onchi, he had to recall exactly where all of these red um, forms belonged because he produced, as far as I know, I think there's three known impressions. There's one at the Art Institute here in Chicago. There's one in the Honolulu Academy of Arts. And I'm fortunate enough to have this impression. And um, I will show you something that you probably have never seen. 
because when you go to the museums, you don't get to see this on the back, but there is an Onchi label. This is an original Onchi label with that is printed with a wood block, and here's his seal, and he, he called this object number two. Here's his signature. The date is April 1954, and he, and he numbered it three out of five. Now, there is a chance that there are two more prints of two more impressions of this print out there in the world. Perhaps one of you watching right now has this print. I hope so. <laughs> but um, I don't know if he finished this run. He made three and he, he may not have finished all five. He probably intended to do five. But as far as we know, there's only three known impressions. Um, and so that's kind of a cool thing to see the label. Um, and so this is Onchi's sort of experimentation with materials and with, um, you know, and how the materials inform the composition. There's this really wonderful sort of dialogue even within the image. What is it? Is, and is it a abstract work? Well, maybe. It is abstract. I mean, what I'm about to say leads, leads into this print quite well. Is it an abstract work? Yes. But it is, is it a representational work of what, of what it re sort of represents in the sense that this print is a, a print of leaves. Now, you could, you could argue it's an abstract composition, and that's correct. And you can read it. There's a kind of a, almost like a narrative that happens in in a lot of his prints, uh, particularly this one. I almost kind of see this as is an experiment of movement as well. And here, it's a print of leaves. Now, is it an abstract composition, or is it, or are they leaves? Is it a representation of leaves? There's this sort of play that happens when you look at these prints. Uh, in your mind where you go back and forth with that. And in this, in this print, this, oh, by the way, I should mention that all three belong to a series of four designs. So I'm fortunate to have three. Maybe one day I'll be able to get the fourth and complete the, 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 the collection. But this is object number, this is, I think, object number three, two, or two, three, and four. I'm missing the first one. So in here, we have a collection of, of different things. This looks like a net, maybe, um, or maybe some sort of, uh, yeah, it looks like a net to me. And of course, this is a leaf, another leaf, a little, uh, like a blue line that Onchi was using to sort of uh, anchor the, des the design. And Gen Yamaguchi used this technique as well, and we'll look at that in a moment. And then this could be the sole of a shoe, or something, and it suggests maybe a seashell. This is the ocean, maybe. Uh, the net connecting to the ocean or a catch. And, and, and then the leaves sort of floating around might connect to the element of air as, as they've been wind, windswept. And the background is made with a wood block that's very active. You could see these wonderful wood grain effects in the background, and that really creates... Uh, unity in the in the composition and also uh, further creates interest to the surface. I mean, this this print. If you're a person who loves surface on a painting, Onchi prints would definitely be right up your alley because these prints always have kind of an element of a surface to them. You know, going back to this one, you could see parts of the pigment that have like a sheen to them, and you could see how thickly applied they are. You could almost see. Uh, like, a, like a thick application of pigment resting right on the surface. So you, you find that, you, you, you kind of find that on all of these really rare self-printed works. This here, this print by Onchi, it belongs to this same series as I mentioned. And these are just planks of wood, again, um, that have been cut and assembled into this composition. They have been inked with different colors. But again, um, um, the, the blocks of wood belong to the group of wood that Onchi collected from his daughter's home, from her renovation. So those prints are fantastic. And so I'm going to kind of put these away and then pull out some, some works that kind of make a connection to them.
Oh, you know, before we go there, I'll show two more fantastic Feng Shui works. It'll just continue the conversation and, and, and really, you know, solidify it. This is a, a wood block. Uh, this is actually, there are no blocks of wood um, displayed here. It's a leaf. And these lines that look like string were actually made with wax paper that was cut in these shapes. And he pressed the, the wax paper that contained pigment with uh, pieces of glass and, and they oozed out a certain way. And it, the title is Leaf and Clouds. And so it's a leaf that's sort of floating around in the, in the sort of in the sky and then these clouds that are forming these really interesting patterns. And so it has a very spontaneous quality to it. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's really interesting. And in a, in a different way, I want to point out this, this masterpiece. This was also done in the late 50s. I think this was a 54 uh, design. And this was made with paper blocks. And we have um, basically two round... Um, forms among different rectangular forms that are creating this really interesting, almost three-dimensional effect. You know, I want to just sort of move the phone right up above so you could see. Uh, all of the elements here were made with paper blocks, which means that because they were made with paper, they were he was only able to achieve one print from the, from the block. So this is it. It's a monoprint. And I think this is a masterpiece. It's a really fantastic work. It's a really wonderful sort of study of composition, forms or shapes interplaying with each other. And also a study of the surface that you get from uh, pigment being applied with paper. I mean, it's fascinating. This is one of those designs that when I pan out, the design is great at any angle. I mean, it, it, it's it's fascinating. I'm just kind of moving the, the, the phones very slowly and go, oh, that's a cool composition. That's a cool composition. That's a cool... I mean, every aspect of this composition is really thought-provoking. So anyway, I, I, I thought I'd show those. And there might be one more that's made out of paper blocks. And then we can have a conversation of what other artists... Did yeah. This is the last one I want to show. It's the last one I want to show. Um, that's by Onchi. Uh, this is a a uh, print made with paper blocks, and it's it's just a, a a really interesting composition where the red is 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 so there's this really interesting interplay between the orange and the red and how. When the forms are printed over each other, you get different sort of shades of the colors. So it's, it's a really interesting uh, composition. There's a really interesting sense of movement in a, in a work that's actually quite narrow, um, particularly within this really narrow sheet of paper. There's a, a feeling that the that design is almost pulsing. So it's a, I think that's a very compelling work made with paper blocks. And so... When we keep, when we when we um, keep that in mind, I have some prints here by other artists who were influenced by the the prints that we were just discussed. So this work by Gen Yamaguchi again, um, we've been talking about him today, and uh, this is uh, a fantastic work from 1956. This was done a year after Onchi died. Onchi died in '55. And uh, I think he died in the summer of 55. And so this print you see, there's string that's used in the composition and maybe even uh, pieces of cloth that is in the background. And of course there's elements of wood. He carved this little black arc that frames the composition. But as far as I know, this is a mono print. Um, it is not numbered, and it is the same exact impression that's in the Genyamaguchi uh, catalog. It's an exhibition catalog, and also one of the better uh, catalog resumes on, on him. And so it's a monoprint, as far as I can tell, utilizing the same sort of techniques and the same aesthetic 
um, that Onchi used in his printmaking. All right, we'll move on. Here, let um, me yeah, pull the print out. Okay, this print is known by the title Back View of Tomorrow. And Genya Maguchi had these really interesting and sometimes far-fetched titles. Sometimes I think they don't really mean anything and you just came up with them. Um, they don't, at least to my mind, some of the designs don't seem to connect to the titles. So... But, um, but some of them do. And in this, in this composition, it's completely abstract, um, like the other one we just saw. And it, there's these block forms that have been assembled together, rectangles, longer ones, shorter ones. And what I want to point out is it has this sort of a three-dimensional quality to it that I believe are connects to these kind of prints in Onchi's works as well, um, in the sense that the pigment rests quite a bit on the surface of the paper, and the way that they're printed, uh, if you recall those, those forms, those in red and orange, where part of the print created a, um, a different color based on the overlapping of, of pigments, well, you get that here. You get that in here. Uh, you, you get that in this area here where it almost becomes more of a shadow when when this form is over printed onto the darker um, rectangular form. So this printing technique that Onchi sort of exploited, uh, th there was currency there among his, his followers and they, they took it uh, and, and exploited it for their own means. And though this print looks quite different from the the orange and red uh, abstraction that Onchi produced maybe three years before this, maybe a little bit earlier than that, maybe six years before this print. Nonetheless, the same sort of idea and techniques are utilized uh, to get a very different um, design. So, yeah. Uh, in my opinion, this is one of Yamaguchi's best works. I mean, it's just a fantastic piece. And in person... You know, these forms sort of float off the paper. You know, I, one of the limiting factors of doing these seminars online is that you don't get to see these prints in person. And I normally would give these talks in Chicago in person. This is before COVID. And they were really successful because, you know, you get to see live uh, artwork in person. But... You know, this isn't too bad, and we'll see how this goes. And plus, a lot of you wouldn't have been able to attend my talks because you live everywhere in the world. And so I'm very happy that you're here joining me today. Um, so the next work, but also by Yamaguchi, is a really wonderful sort of um, print that is an assemblage of different things. We have, I think this is like a textile material. We have some... The, these look like thistles, but I think this was carved out of a block to make to, to suggest thistles. And this is a, a leaf, a real leaf, I believe. And then, of course, you know, Yamaguchi was very fond of using these sort of these these angular forms um, or lines. We, we see that in this print with the line there. And we also saw that in Onchi's print with the leaf. If you recall that blue line that was right there, very similar technique. And I think, you know, both of those artists used that quite well. And so in this print, I just want to highlight the, the obviously the design is just gorgeous. There's a wonderful sense of light that's emanating from the center of the composition. This is a mono print as well. And so you wouldn't, would not have seen this anywhere. It's not illustrated in any, any books. And I just wanted to share this with all of you. And, you know, again, to show yet another print that connects to Onji's printing techniques.
All right, I, I was about to move on, but I'll show this one as well. This is another Yamaguchi, and this is a one I just picked up recently. And it, of course, shows this sort of string-like form uh, with a leaf. This is so convincing, it almost looks like the leaf is actually embedded into the paper, but it, it is, in fact, printed. But it's so convincing. I mean, I just think that's amazing. And um, and then this sort of abstract composition um, that sort of builds up the the whole image. It's, it's really fascinating. I, I love the colors. It's very earthy. Uh, but again, one more example of these techniques that Onchi sort of. Uh, I would say that either he created or he and Genya Maguchi sort of came to to use at the same time. But nonetheless, it's a really wonderful example of a work being produced around Onji. Oh, and I should mention, in terms of dates, these two designs are either, I would say, 1954, 55, um, or 56. They're either right before Onchi died or, or right after. Now, I, I also, let me, let me see what else I pulled out. Oh, yeah. I want to I want to show a, another print. I guess I spoke about Kitaoka earlier, and this worked out quite well. I didn't actually plan that, but it's funny how those things do work. This I did plan on talking about sh uh, quickly, uh, but we Kitaoka is one of those artists that was really versatile as well. We discussed Shinagawa. We discussed Onchi's versatile ver Onchi's ability to be versatile in his images. Um, he was quite flexible and was quite capable of making something in abstraction one day and something representational the next day. Well, Kitaoka was the same way. And um, he, he did develop an abstract period. And this is sort of when he was kind of experimenting with abstraction, but still rooted in, in, in representational work. So this can be read as a cityscape. And there's all these buildings um, that look quite modern, actually. And also the materials that are used are really interesting, which exploit the surface, exploit the materials that he used to make the, 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 the print. And here we see this like wood grain, which may be an actual block of wood, or he may have even just carved this. Uh, he may have even carved all of the elements in this composition as opposed to just taking a wood a piece of wood and just printing it. But the point I want to make here is that th there's a connection between this design and the, the prints that Onchi made that were of found objects, particularly wood. He was, he was very fond of the natural quality in wood. And Kitaoka here is experimenting with different shapes and surfaces, and wood is certainly something that was um, of interest to him. The other thing I'll point out, notice the printing technique here. Again, we've seen this before in other prints. It's kind of wet, kind of uneven, very expressive. Again, that connects this print to the earlier prints that Kitaoka made, or that portrait that looked like the portrait of Hagiwara. And so we see this conversation unfolding and changing. So the poem that we, if we could go back to my my metaphor of, of a linked verse, um, you know, that poem that's being constructed that perhaps was started by Anji, um, is playing out to end quite differently from how it started. And so that's kind of fun and kind of interesting. So I wanna, I wanna end our conversation with two, two works by artists that were around Onchi, but not necessarily part of, of the Ichimoku uh, Kai. Let me just see if I can pull these out. So in this print, um, this is by Chizuko Yoshida, and she was a very famous woodblock print artist. She was also a painter. She married Hodaka Yoshida of the 
illustrious Yoshida family of printmakers who Hodaka's parents were uh, Hiroshi Yoshida and Fujio Yoshida, both very important 20th century Shinhanga artists. Chizuko, uh, though worked in representational formats before, um, earlier in her career, and this is pretty early, uh, she really experimented with abstraction um, around um, Onchi. She she did study with Onchi for a very short period of time. She, I, I think, gave a talk. I, I, there's a video somewhere on YouTube, you could probably find it, where she talks about her work and how in her early uh, period or early years, she met Onchi and he encouraged her to experiment with printmaking, to with different objects to see what kind of effects she can achieve. And this work, it's simply titled Composition. It's dated 1954 with a two, assuming two meaning February. And the, the composition is a really interesting. It, it is made up basically of just different found objects. And I use the term found, but you know, it's purposeful. Maybe she did buy that string for this particular piece and it wasn't found per se, but they're, they're objects that are not necessarily what intended for printmaking. They're just objects. And so this is an object print. String clearly is used. Uh, I'm not sure what this is, but it might be a piece of a leaf or some sort of, I don't know, it looks very organic. And, and then there, this form here um, looks like lace of some kind or, or, or some something. Uh, but the point I wanted to make is that this this print is a mono print. There's a, there's because of the way that she made this print, each step was very. I mean, in some ways, it, it was you you couldn't replicate it because she put the string a certain way, inked it, and pressed it into the the paper. You wouldn't necessarily be able to get the exact. Um, the exact composition of the string. So you might be able to rework the design to look similarly, but you're not going to get this exact impression. And so it's very much like Onchi's printmaking. Um, it's it's a monoprint, it's experimental, um, you know, and I, I and it's very unusual. And she only made a few of these really wonderful monoprints. Um, and they were made right when she was working with Onchi. And as he passed away, and she also got married to to Hodaka right around this time, she went on a honeymoon trip to Latin America. And so, and she moved in a different direction. There were some prints that she produced after this print that were of musical, they're influenced by music or musical compositions. She has a design called Mambo. There's one really famous one that's a mono print called Mambo. And I don't believe uh, the family ever sold that one, but there are other prints of musical compositions. There's a Mambo 2 that is not a mono print that you could find in the, in the marketplace. But the point is, Onchi started making prints inspired by music in the, in the late 20s, early 30s. And that continued throughout his career. He was a big fan of uh, classical orchestral music and he kind of connected abstraction to just music without words. And, and so in her early work, Hodaka, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Chizuko Yoshida created a few pieces of abstraction influenced by Onchi um, in the sense that they were connected to musical composition pieces. And that leads into this work. This print is by Anse Uchima. And Unchima is an interesting character to end the conversation with uh, because Uchima actually met Onchi because Uchima was uh, an interpreter. And Uchima, I think either he was hired by Oliver Statler to come to Onchi's home to interpret you know, the conversations between Onchi, Oliver Statler, and other people in Onchi's work. And so uh, the point is that Uchima was an artist when he we traveled to Japan, but I think he was part of the military and he was he was an interpreter for and and because of of um, 
Onchi's sort of influence. And I mean, Onchi was such a charismatic uh, character that, I mean, it's funny, even today, when I talk about Onchi, people want to sort of pick up um, printmaking and do something for themselves. And I think his prints speak to his spirit. And so in this impression, this is a mono print by Uchima, done roughly about 1955. Uh, you know, he was maybe late 40s, early 50s, or no, I'm sorry, 1955, uh, because I believe he was in Japan still at this time, maybe even before Onchi's death. But the point is, it's titled A Tune, and it's connecting uh, this composition of abstraction to a musical work that he may have heard. And of, of course, these forms might look a little Onchi-esque, but they have their own Uchima quality. Um, but it, it's a really interesting sort of scene to, to look at Uchima at the beginning of his career as a woodblock print artist, experimenting with uh, forms that may have been influenced by Onchi, but certainly the idea of creating a composition um, based on music uh, it, it, that is uh, abstract, you know, th that is a very Onchi-esque thing. Um, and so these two works are direct, um, you, you, I, could, I could see them as direct, um, it's a direct communication to the, the, the teacher that inspired them, and of course that being Onchi. So, um, you know, that's going to wrap up our conversation uh, for, for today. But before I go, um, I want to finalize our, our, our talk by introducing some books that you might not be familiar with. So the, the first book, um, and there's a lot of material that we looked at today, is illustrated and discussed in this book. It's by Lawrence Smith, uh, Japanese prints during the Allied occupation, 1945 to 1952. It's a, it's a really good book about this topic. I highly recommend it. There, the, the book that kind of started all of this is called Modern Japanese Prints. Um, it's by Oliver Statler. This is an early edition hardcover, but it comes in a soft cover. And um, it's, it, some people call it the Bible for Sosaku Hanga. He, Oliver Statler was in Japan at this time. He knew Onchi, he knew all the artists, and so he had insight information about these works. Another uh, book that I would highlight is Hanga, Japanese Creative Prints. Excellent resource. Um, I would, I would, there's a lot of great essays in there, and, it's a, and if you're just starting to learn about Sosaku Hanga, that's also a really good uh, place to start as well. It's a great scholarly uh, reference. And um, another book that I highly recommend is Modern Japanese Prints, uh, let's see, Modern Japanese Woodblock Prints, The, the Early Years by, she is uh, basically the number one, that book is basically the, I, I, I would say the number one reference on 20th century uh, books. Um, there's the New Wave, but that's more, mostly focused on Shinhanga. This, in particular, uh, reference is divided into two uh, portions. One is Shinhanga, the other is Sosaku Hanga. And a lot of the information that she gives um, has still has stood the test of time. That book is maybe 25 years old, maybe even older, and uh, it's still a great resource. I still use it to this day. And the last book I want to point out is it's a Rikar exhibition of the Ichimoku Kai. And so this book illustrates here, I don't know if I could show this, but this book illustrates basically all of the Ichimoku shoe prints that were produced. Now I had one in my um, bookstore. I recently have sold it. Um, I'll probably get one whenever I find it. It's actually quite rare, but I recommend that book because it illustrates all of the Ichimoku Ichimoku shoe prints, uh, and so it gives you an understanding of the diversity of style as well as the artistry that was used to produce these great prints from this period. So there you have it, Link Verse, the 
the prints that the artists working around Onchi produced. I think, um, you know, for those of you who know me or who've been following me on Woodblock Wednesday, you know that Onchi is one of my favorite artists. And I think the, the, right now there isn't a lot of information on him. I, I really would love to see a lot more produced, a lot more scholarship. Um, but there, there is some out there, and I encourage you to pick up some books um, and read about him and look and engage um, on his artwork. I think he left an amazing legacy of art for all of us, whether you're interested in representational um, images, images of beautiful women, bijinga, or abstraction, Onchi produced some of the most compelling designs in all of those categories that uh, it's, just, it's just amazing. So I encourage all of you to have a look. And so thank you for joining me in our seminar today. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to either shoot me an email. You could leave a, a question here below in the email or in the, in the video link. And I'm, I'd be happy to address any questions. Uh, this was a very long uh, seminar as opposed to my Woodblock Wednesdays, but I hope you could join me for those as well. So thank you. I'm Elias Martin of Collecting Japanese Prints, um, of CollectingJapanesePrints.com. I invite you to go to my website, have a look. Oh, and one last thing. I'm going to have a wonderful exhibition of Western artists working in Asia. The exhibition is called... Um, Eastern sales, or Eastern, I'm sorry, Western sales, Eastern skies, Western artists working in Asia. So have a look on my website. The exhibition will go up um, by next Friday. Something interesting for you to have a look. So thank you again for joining me. And if this was uh, worthwhile and interesting to you, please comment. I'll do another video, um, a seminar like this, probably in, in a couple of months. Let me know if there's anything in particular you'd like me to cover. I'd really appreciate that. Thank you again for joining me.